Hey, good morning, my North Park family. So good to see you this morning. I'm glad that you are here. I'm glad uh, many of you are watching online. We welcome you. Uh, I'm Pastor Bill. If you're new to our church, we're so glad that you're here. Uh, let me welcome you officially and just tell you thank you for coming uh, to worship the Lord with us today. You're very welcome here. And I would love to meet you if you're new to our church right after the service we have a reception called Meet the Pastor, and I will be right out these doors to the right. And I would love for you to come by and meet, uh, have the opportunity to meet you. I'll wear my mask, and you can wear your mask, and we can stay a little bit apart. But I'd love to meet you and uh, just greet you officially. I have a gift from our church I'd love to give you. So if you have a second, stop by and, and let me meet you right after the service. If you are coming and you've been here for a while, and you feel like the Lord is leading you, join our North Park family, or you have a decision of faith that you would like to make, come by and see me as well, and you can join the church uh, right there at Meet the Pastor. Hey, celebrate with me a young man who came a couple of weeks ago and who joined our North Park family through baptism. Uh, this handsome fella is Eli Duckworth. Let's welcome Eli as a new member of our North Park family. Uh, through baptism. Uh, we're excited to have him. Uh, let me just share a quick word with you and say Merry Christmas to you. Uh, this week is Christmas week, and I hope that you have a wonderful Christmas with your family. Uh, you may know we, ha we have three services coming up this week. We originally had two, and we've added a third because our candlelight Lord's Supper services for uh, the 23rd at 6 p.m. and the 24th at 6 p.m. are already full. And so we're excited about that. We're going to have a full crowd. And by full, I mean socially distanced full. And so we've, we're going to have everybody spread out, but we have capacity that we're going to have. So we've opened up a third candlelight Lord's Supper service on Christmas Eve at 4 p.m. And we still have room for that one. So if you want to come... Uh, to our Christmas Eve candlelight service, you, you want to register for the 4 p.m. service. We've, we've got openings. And let me tell you what we're going to do. When you come in, uh, there are going to be three things in the lobby. Uh, one of the things will be the manger. You know, we always do our March the Manger and give our Lottie Moon Christmas offering. If you haven't already given it, it will be out in the lobby, and we encourage you as a family to come by and drop your Lottie Moon Christmas offering in the manger. And then we're going to have cards that have names of our missionaries that are going to be on the card. That These are the missionaries we support with our Lottie Moon Christmas offering. So when you drop your, your offering in the manger, if you'll take one of those cards, and when you gather at Christmas, maybe for your dinner time or uh, whatever, use that card to pray for the missionary. That's one of the missionaries that we support. Also in the lobby, uh, there will be a little packet that will have the Lord's Supper elements in it. Because we're not passing anything, but we have found that we can do the Lord's Supper. And so as you come in, get a packet for every member of your family that is a born-again believer. And you can pull the tab and you'll have the juice and your, uh, your, your bread in, in that packet. And I'm looking forward to sharing communion together. And then the third thing will be the candle that we will light during the service, and you'll want to grab that. So it's going to be a very wonderful service. I'm looking forward uh, to seeing you at one of our three services uh, for candlelight, Lord's Supper. Well, if you have your Bible today, and I hope that you do, open with me to Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. This morning, I want to talk to you about the witness of the wise men. And so as you open your Bible there, uh, let me just say that tomorrow night, you may want to go outside and look up into the night sky, uh, because tomorrow night, uh, the, the planets of Jupiter and Saturn are going to adjoin, and, and they're going to perform some beautiful works in the sky that many are calling the Christmas star of 2020. Uh, many people believe, scholars that really study the stars have, have said, there's a lot of articles you can read on it, that this might have been the very thing that happened uh, that night in Bethlehem when the Christmas star was over the manger and later over the house where Jesus was. 
And, and it was that star of Bethlehem. And there are many that believe it was this same thing, the conjunction that uh, the aligning of Saturn and Jupiter, our two largest planets, that formed that star. If they, you go back to that time and at the winter solstice, solstice, there was the alignment that happened at the time of Christ's birth. This alignment that we can see tomorrow night has not happened for 800 years. So this is the first time in 800 years that this has happened. So it's really cool. Now, can we say with certainty that this was the Christmas star, that this was the star, that this is what happened over Bethlehem's manger? No, we can't say that with certainty. Uh, it may have been the Shekinah glory of God that was that star. We don't really know for certain, but it could have been. And there are many scholars who think that it was. But regardless, at a time that we're living in, at a time where it just seems so dark at times, it's going to be a beautiful sight to see the glory of God. You know, the psalmist says that the glory of God is seen in his handiwork. And we're going to see the glory of God in his handiwork tomorrow night as these two, <coughs> two stars come together. And as this star maybe came together at the first advent of Christ, think with me, church, could these two stars come together could it be the second advent of Christ? Could tomorrow night, Monday night, could Monday night when these stars come together be the rapture of the church? Well, let me just say, absolutely it could be. Any day that we live right now could be the rapture of the church. The early church lived with great anticipation, expecting the second coming of Christ, and so should we. We should be living right now as we see all the prophecies being fulfilled of the second advent of Christ, we should be living with great anticipation, expectation at the return of Christ. It could be Monday night or it could be many other nights. I don't know, but let's live with that expectation. Our Savior is coming back again. But regardless, the wise men did the wisest thing you can ever do. The main thought I want to share with you this morning is that the wisest thing you can ever do is to pursue Jesus. And we're going to read the story this morning of wise men from the east, magi, that, that left on a journey pursuing a star, and they're seeking the king of the Jews. And the wisest thing that any of us can ever do is to pursue Jesus. So would you stand with me to honor the reading of God's word and follow along with me in your Bible? As we read about the visit of the wise men, in Matthew 2, beginning with verse 1, it says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men, magi, from the east, came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? Where is he? For we have seen his star when it rose, and we've come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. Then they told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for it is written by the prophet, and they quote here from Micah the prophet, Micah chapter 5 verse 2, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who shall shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem saying, Go search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and they worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. 
And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Christmas story. And these magi are a very important part of the Christmas story. And Father, we see in them men that were willing to make a very long and perhaps dangerous journey because they so wanted to find the Messiah. They were seeking Him. God, the wisest thing anyone ever does is to seek after your Son, Jesus. Teach us about that this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So indeed, the wisest thing that we can ever do is to pursue Jesus. And and that applies to you if you're a man. If you're a man and you have wisdom, then in your heart you pursue after Jesus. And it, it applies to you if you're a woman as well. The wisest thing that a, that a woman ever does is seek after Jesus. As a matter of fact, I read this uh, several years ago, and I wrote it down. I can't remember the source, but I, I thought it was good. It, it said, if it had been wise women instead of wise men, they would have asked for directions and they would have arrived on time. They would have helped deliver the baby and clean the stable and made a casserole. And they would have brought practical gifts, including diapers, wipes, bibs, and formula. But that's another story. (laughs) And indeed, it is another story. But whether you're a wise man or a wise woman, and it might have been better if it had been wise women, the wisest thing that you can ever do is seek after the Messiah. So, So look with me three things that we see in this story this morning. Number one, it is wise to seek Jesus. In verse 1, Jesus had been born in Bethlehem in the days of Herod the king, and these wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. Let me tell you a little bit about these wise men. There there are myths that have developed around the Christmas story that are not true related to these guys. I hate to bust your bubble about the wise men at your manger scene, but let me tell you three myths just for your own knowledge about the wise men. One of the myths says that they were three kings from the Orient. And and that's a myth because they were not kings. Kings were not magi. Magi were men in in a kingdom like Babylon or Persia that were astrologers. They studied the stars. Often they worshiped pagan gods. They were involved in sorcery. They had the ability to interpret dreams And so they did have wisdom, and because they had wisdom, they were often affiliated with a kingdom. They would be an advisor to a king. They would be high up in the kingdom. Often the king would bring them in to interpret dreams that he had. We we read about them a lot in the book of Daniel during the Babylonian uh, empire when the Babylonians conquered the Jewish people and they took the Jews captive into Babylon. Daniel and the young Jewish boys that were taken into Babylon, they wrote about, Daniel wrote about the Magi. And Daniel became a person under the inspiration of God who could interpret dreams. As a matter of fact, Daniel could interpret dreams because God gave him a supernatural gift that the magi of Babylon could not interpret. So many of the magi that were pagan astrologers began to respect Daniel, this man of God. And and they began to see him as the greatest interpreter of all, and they respected him. And King Nebuchadnezzar eventually elevated Daniel to a high place in his kingdom. And then when the, when the Medes and the Persian conquered the Babylonians, it was then that, that the satraps and some of the other political leaders got jealous of Daniel. And it was when they said, Daniel, you cannot pray to your God. The government said, you cannot pray to your God. You can only pray to our king, King Darius. And they, they, they tricked Darius into a decree that said, if you pray to any other god, you'll be put in the lion's den. And Daniel was respectful of his government, but he knew that he had a higher authority than any worldly government. 
And, and that when the government tried to tell him that you can't do something that God the Father has commanded you to do, that you have a higher authority. And so Daniel threw his windows open. I mean, he didn't try to hide. He threw his windows open and he prayed to God like he did every day. And of course, we know the story of how they put him in the lion's den and, and God supernaturally shut the mouths of the lions. God protected him. And it only made Daniel's fame spread all the more. Daniel was an incredibly powerful witness for God. And it was Daniel, listen, in his prophecies, he wrote about the ancient of days. He wrote about the prince who is to come. He wrote about Jesus. He wrote prophecies about the first and the second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ. And his witness was so powerful, I believe that's how these magi from the east, likely from that same area of Persia, knew about the coming of the Messiah. They learned it from Daniel 500 years earlier. And the powerful witness of Daniel among those magi continued to be spread generation after generation after generation. And 500 years later, here come these magi from the east seeking after something that the Jewish people were oblivious to. I mean, the Jews who had all the prophecies were oblivious to the fact that in Bethlehem's manger... There was a baby being born who was their Messiah. But these magi knew and understood that the Messiah was being born. What an amazing, amazing thing. The powerful witness of one godly man named Daniel. And in verse 2, they came to Jerusalem saying, Where is he who has been born the king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it arose, and we have come to worship him. Wow. Wow. They were seeking. You know, when I think about us today, there are two kinds of seekers, I believe, in the world today. There are born-again believers who are seeking we have our heart full of Jesus. Our hearts are full. But, but what we desire is we want to know him more. We desire to, to know him better and to grow into, into more knowledge and more commitment to Christ. That's why we're here today. That's why we come to worship him. Because we are seeking to know him more. The psalmist said, as, my, as the deer pants for the water brooks, so pants my soul for you, O God. I thirst for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Is that what you feel in your heart today? Just that desire, even in a dark time like this, I want to know him more. I know that, that knowing him and serving him and living for him is, is the greatest joy of my life. I'm a seeker like that. Paul said that I may know him, the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. Paul wanted to know him with greater intimacy. And so, beloved, we gather here week after week because we want to know him more. We study our Bible every day. We open the Word of God because we desire to know him more. That's such a healthy, healthy thing to be a believer whose heart is full of Jesus, but we seek after him. We seek more to know him more every day. And then the second kind of seeker is what I call an unbelieving seeker. An unbeliever who's a seeker is someone whose heart is empty. Their heart is not full. Their heart is empty. And, and they go around trying to find something that will fill the void in their heart. And they can't find anything that will fill that void. They take riches and power and influence and popularity. And they think that if I gain these things, it'll fill the void of my heart. But nothing will fill it. And then somewhere along the way, they begin to seek. 
They begin to seek what is it that can fill the void. And maybe at some point they hear about Christ. They hear uh, about a relationship with God, about salvation. And they begin to seek. They may come to church. They may begin to build a friendship with a, with a believer that talks to them about their testimony. We welcome people like that at our church. We long for there to be seekers who are not believers yet, but they're seeking, they're wanting to know more, they're, they're searching for, for, for a relationship with, with, with maybe a God that they don't fully know and they don't really understand Him, but, but they believe they're not atheists, they believe that there is a God there, they just don't have a relationship with Him yet. Oh, we, we long for there to be seekers such as that. We see the example of a, a seeker like that in the Bible. In John chapter 3, verse 1, we're introduced to a Pharisee named Nicodemus. He was very religious. He, he was a good man from everything we know about him, but he was lost. He, he still was empty on the inside. He didn't have that relationship with God the Father. The, re the religion that he was practicing was a dead religion. And, and, and he heard about Jesus. He had seen Jesus do miracles, and he was a ruler of the Jews. But this man came to Jesus by night. He came at night because he knew that his peers would not think highly of him if they knew that he was coming to Jesus. He knew he'd be persecuted. He knew that they would probably uh, ostracize him, maybe even kick him out of the high court that he was a part of, the Sanhedrin, if they thought he was seeking after Jesus. But he came to Jesus because he was seeker, and he said, Rabbi, call him a teacher. He said, we know that you're a teacher come from God, for, for no one can do these signs that you do unless... God is with him. He had seen Jesus do miracles. And Jesus said to him directly, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. I mean, Jesus cut through the chase. And, and Jesus said, Nicodemus, all your practice of religion and good works cannot save you. The only way that you'll have that void filled and have a relationship with God is you must and notice Jesus used the word must. You must be born again. And Nicodemus did not understand it. He, he, he responded and said, How can a man like me, an old man, be born when he is old? And Jesus said to him, That which is born of the flesh is flesh, but that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. He's saying, Nicodemus, there's a physical birth, and then there's a spiritual birth. When you're born, you're born physically, but there has to come a time in your life where you're born again spiritually in order to have a relationship with God. He said, do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. And then Jesus explained it. In verse 14, he said to Nicodemus, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness so must the Son of Man be lifted up. The reason that Jesus used this story that comes from the book of Numbers, when the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they began to grumble and complain, and they, got, they, they were sick and they were dying, and, and they began to pray for God to save them. And God said to Moses, take a serpent and put it on a pole. The serpent that had bit them, the serpents that put poison in their body, the poison that was killing them, God said, put it on a pole and, and tell the people to look at the serpent on the pole and they will be saved. Boy, if there was ever an Old Testament picture of Christ and the cross that brings healing and salvation, that was it. And Nicodemus, being a Pharisee, would have read that story. He knew that story. And, and Jesus was using the Scripture to share the gospel with Nicodemus. And then he said to Nicodemus that whoever believes may have eternal life. We wonder, 
we ask the question, did Nicodemus ever believe? At this point, he didn't. At this point, he turned and walked away, but he was seeking. And in my heart, I can't say with absolute certainty, but I do believe that he became a believer. Because when Jesus died on the cross, I believe that Nicodemus remembered these words. I believe they were ringing in his ear. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And, and, and those words, when Jesus was dying on the cross, had to be ringing in Nicodemus' ear. And right after that, when Jesus died, the Bible says that Nicodemus and another Pharisee named Joseph of Arimathea came in the daylight and asked for Jesus' body so that they could bury it. In my heart, I believe that Nicodemus found what he was searching for. He was a seeker who couldn't fill the void until he put his faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I think I'll see Nicodemus in heaven. I hope that I will. Many seekers that are seeking after the Lord, the Lord will reveal himself to them. The wisest thing we can ever do is seek after Jesus. Whether you're a Christian or you're not a Christian yet, the wisest thing you ever do is seek Him with all your heart. Notice, notice the second thing. Not only is it wise to seek Jesus, it's wise to share Jesus. These wise men are sharing Jesus with the Jews. They're, they're coming to say, where is He? We want to worship Him. They're witnessing for Christ. And it says, when Herod the king heard this, it troubled him and all Jerusalem with him. And he assembled the chief priests and the scribes of the people and inquired of them, where is this Christ supposed to be born? And they said, in Bethlehem of Judah, Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. And Micah the prophet, if you look in the Old Testament book of Micah, chapter 5, verse 2, Micah said specifically, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. And then Herod summoned the wise men and, and, and secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem saying, Go and search diligently for this child and when you have found him, bring me the word that I too may come and worship him. It's sad to me. It breaks my heart to think that these Jewish people that knew the prophecy, that knew what Micah had said, they were only five miles from Bethlehem. Bethlehem, where Jesus is born, is five miles south of Jerusalem. These magi had come hundreds of miles to seek him. And they were not even, they were Gentiles. They were not God's people, the Jews. God had given the prophecy to the Jews. They're only five miles away. And, and the magi go and seek him. And, and the religious leaders of the day didn't even care enough to go see it for themselves. They didn't even go to see what these wise men were talking about. Oh, how sad. One of the amazing things that I believe that God does on a regular basis, listen to me, come in here with me, is when there is a seeking soul who's lost, somebody who begins to be aware of the emptiness of their heart, and they begin to wonder about God and is God out there? And can God make a difference? Here's what God does. God will take a seeking soul and, and He will have them cross the path of a willing witness. And that is what we call a divine appointment. When a seeking soul crosses the path of a willing witness, there is a divine appointment. There is an opportunity for those of us who are believers in Christ, to share the gospel and lead someone to Christ. I believe scripturally, and I believe with all my heart, that God orchestrates that all the time. That if you're here and you're a believer and you're a willing witness, God will bring you across the path of a seeking soul 
a lot, many times. The problem is, many of us today, many in the church, we're totally oblivious. Or our eyes are not open, our hearts are not open, our antennas are not up. God creates divine appointments, we're not even aware of it. We, we, we're, we're not even aware that maybe this past week, God set up a divine appointment for you. There was one perfectly set up for you, and you didn't even recognize it. These, these wise men, God brought them to Jerusalem to announce to the Jewish people that what you've been waiting for is here, and they didn't even see it. Let me show you a, a beautiful example of a divine appointment. In Acts, in Acts chapter 8, there's a guy named Philip. And Philip was actually one of the first deacons of the New Testament church. In the New Testament church, deacons were not only great servants, but they were great soul winners. Deacons served and they shared the gospel. They were bold. And, and Philip was a willing witness. And there was an angel of God that somehow... Uh, I don't know if he saw the angel or just the angel somehow communicated to Philip that God wants you to arise and go to the south to a road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert. I can almost imagine Philip like, why would God want me to go to the desert? Why would God want me to go there? But notice what the Bible says. He rose and went. Simple obedience. He rose and went. When he got there, lo and behold, in the middle of the desert, there happened to be an entourage, a caravan of Ethiopians, and there was a eunuch who was a servant of the queen who was riding in a chariot. He was a high-ranking official. And he sees this entourage of Ethiopians, high-ranking people out in the middle of the desert. They had been to Jerusalem to worship, even though this man was not a, a believer yet. He was seeking because he had been to Jerusalem to worship, and he was on his way back. And when Philip saw him, the Spirit, who's that? That's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit spoke to Philip and said, go over and join his chariot. Wow, that would take courage. He had already obeyed to go to the desert. And now the Spirit is saying, go and approach this man. Go and engage this high-ranking official. And you know what the Bible says he did? He did not even hesitate. The Bible says he ran. I mean, when the Holy Spirit said, go engage this guy, Philip took off and ran. And when he got there, this Ethiopian eunuch just so happened, by coincidence, right, to be reading from Isaiah the prophet, and he was reading a passage related to the lamb that was led to the slaughter. He was reading the prophet Isaiah about the Messiah, about Christ, about his sacrificial death. And, and Philip asked him, do you understand what you're reading? And the eunuch said, about whom I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself or someone else? You know what you call that? That is a divine appointment. And Philip, look at this. Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this very scripture in Isaiah, he told him the good news, the gospel about Jesus. And the, the, the Ethiopian eunuch believed, and he said, hey, there's some water out here in the desert. And he said, what would hinder me from being baptized? And Philip said, nothing if you believe. And Philip baptized this Ethiopian eunuch in the desert of Gaza. What an amazing story. God orchestrated that whole thing. A seeking soul, and God brought him across the path of a willing witness, and the result was glorious salvation. And I believe for every true believer that's a willing witness, God will do the same. God will create, orchestrate divine appointments for us if we're willing to listen. If we're watching, 
Right now, we have a world, I believe, that is seeking. The darkness is overwhelming. There's no answers out there. We, the church, is the only one that has the answer. We have the gospel. I believe that there's windows of gospel opportunity that are wide open. If we will watch for those, I believe that God will give us divine appointments to engage people and to share with them our testimony and to share the gospel with them. Wouldn't it be awesome if this day that we think of as a terrible year, 2020 became the open door for revival in our nation and believers begin to share their faith and lead lost people to Christ because there's a lot of seeking souls out there? Let's be wise. Let's look for opportunities to share the gospel. The day is open. Many of us are going to be gathering with some of our friends and family. Now listen, our gatherings may be smaller this year. It may be more intimate this year. It might be that because it's more intimate and smaller, that there's a There's a good opportunity there for us as believers and willing witnesses to share Christ with those who may be seeking Him. Let's take those opportunities. Let's use this wonderful season of the Savior's birth as an opportunity to tell people about Him. Well, the last thing quickly. It is not only wise to seek Jesus, to share Jesus but to serve Jesus. These wise men, they worshipped him. They served him with their worship. It says they, they went on their way. They saw the star again. And boy, when they saw it, it, it led them to the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And going to the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down And they worshipped him. They worshipped him. There's coming a time soon in the near future where we've got to get back to worship again. We can't stay away from worship forever. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ, I believe this with all my heart, is the most essential gathering of people in the entire world. In the world. There's no more essential place than the church. We are the light of the world. There's no other place that's the light of the world. There's no other place that that is the the beacon of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. No other place on earth has the answer to the problem of sin and eternal life. We are more essential than any bar, any strip club, any other place on the earth. We have at best a 97, 98% survival rate even if we were to get covid And our church is practicing incredible social practices with COVID. We we sanitize the chairs between each service. We wear masks, even though we hate wearing masks. And and, and we set apart. We're doing a good job. And there's got to be a time that we, the people of faith, come together with courage to do what God has called us to do. And so I'm saying to those of you who are watching online, we're so glad that you're watching online. And if you're sick and you need to be quarantined, then you need to be quarantined. But there's a point that we've got to come back together. And I pray in 2021 that that it won't be too distant into that year that we come back together to be the church that God has called us to be because it is what we do. We come together to worship Him also, we, we give our gifts to him. We give, they, they opened their treasure and offered him gold and frankincense and myrrh. They gave him their best. And I thank you for your faithful giving financially. We also want to give our gifts and our talents to God in service. We want to serve him. And then they also gave their obedience to him. In verse 12, 
It says they were warned in a dream not to return to Herod. Herod said, come and tell me where he is. I'm going to worship him. He was lying. And they listened to God. They didn't listen to the king. They listened to God and they departed to their own country by another way. Do you hear what I just said? They didn't listen to the king. They listened to God. And as believers in Christ, we are to respect our governing authorities. We're to respect them. We're to understand that God has put them there for a reason. But they are never a higher authority than the Lord our God. Never. And when the, when the dictate of earthly kings or rulers is contradicting the word of our living God, we are to be loyal to the word of our living God no matter what. These wise men did not obey Herod. They obeyed the word of God. And then we're living in a day unprecedented And we have got to obey the Lord our God no matter what. Let's be brave. Let's be courageous. Let's be respectful. Let's be loving. But let's obey the word of the Lord our God. It's so sad that Herod didn't really mean what he said. I wish that he did. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1, the Bible says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Beloved, let's give ourselves, our lives, our bodies, as a living sacrifice to God. I miss... A dear friend that many of you miss as well, Calvin Miller. Calvin Miller, wasn't he a great man of God? Wonderful member of our church. He was a dear friend to me and Rondi. We would, every Christmas, we would get together with, with him, and uh, we enjoyed time in their home, and we'd always have dessert together and pray together. Charles, he, he was a great writer, and one of the books he wrote about Christmas is called The Christ of Christmas. And Calvin said this. He said, how glorious the Christmas story might have been if Herod had really meant what he said. If Herod had fallen down and began to worship the infant Christ, his whole future would have been glorious. But he didn't. He had no appetite for worship, no hunger for the divine visitation of God. How sad. And the same is true for every one of us. If if we were to fall down and worship Him today, if we were to open our heart to Him today, our whole future would be different. You see, the wisest thing we ever do is to pursue Jesus. Are you seeking Him? Are you seeking Him with all your heart? Are you giving your all to Jesus? Oh, I pray that in the year ahead, we will commit to give Him our all. Would you bow with me as we bow before God this morning? Father... Lord, I pray that as we think about the year ahead, that, that God, we will not be fearful. I pray that we will not be apathetic or indifferent. But I pray that our church will approach the year ahead with more ardor than we've ever had to worship our God. To, li- to give our bodies as living sacrifices. To sell out in being a willing witness for you to look for divine appointments. I pray, God, that the year ahead will be a year that we are the church that you've called us to be. Lord, may we surrender our lives to you today. And God, I pray for that person here today who may not, who may not be saved. They're searching, they haven't yet found that thing that fills the void in their heart. And I pray this morning, God, that you're drawing them to Jesus and that they're realizing that Jesus Christ, the baby born in a manger, the the Son of God who died on the cross, who rose from the dead, is the only one who can fill that void. And I pray today would be the day of salvation for them. And if that's you, if you're here today and you've been seeking and you realize that you want to give your life to Jesus, whether you're in this room or you're watching online, I pray that right now you would open your heart to Christ. Would you pray this prayer with me? Pray it right there in your heart. Dear Jesus, I need you. I realize you're the only thing that can fill the void in my heart. 
And I pray right now, Lord Jesus, that you would come into my life. I take you to be my Lord and my Savior. Thank you for dying for my sin. Thank you that you rose from the dead. I believe in you and I put all my trust in you. Forgive me for my sin and help me to live for you for the rest of my life. I receive your forgiveness. And right now by faith, I receive your gift of eternal life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, welcome to the family of God. Hallelujah. You're a child of God. That void is now filled. I'll be outside at Meet the Pastor. Come on, let me know you prayed that prayer. Let me encourage you and pray with you. If you prayed that prayer online, send me an email or a text right now and let me know so that I can encourage you.